Hello and welcome. We are going to start on the General Electric Model 250. Uh, briefly before we do, Vic didn't want the other Emerson and the more I looked at mine the more dissatisfied I was with that front panel. It just if, if it was in the right light you couldn't see anything but when the light hit it just right there was more damage than was evident. I realized it was a crease along the bottom. So I pulled the front panel off the one that Vic didn't want and did some sheet metal repair work on it and that's in primer. And I think that this one's going to be pretty much flawless when I finish with it. It, uh, it came out really nice. So as soon as I've got some decent paint and some clear coat on it, we'll change out those front panels. I've got the retaining clips on order from McMaster Car, the little rectangular push-on clips, and uh, we'll get that fixed up. And That radio will be absolutely gorgeous when it's done. The speaker for Thomas's car radio should be here, I'm guessing either tomorrow or the day after. Uh, Vic sent that two-day priority. So uh, we're looking forward to getting that in if it fits. I got my fingers crossed. Uh, I want to get this radio back to the guy so he can get it in his car. He keeps telling me not to worry. It's not there's no hurry, but it's driving me nuts that it's been here this long. What else? Um, oh, uh, I've got another one of these coming, and they're claiming delivery will be here tomorrow on this. I bought the second one just so I'd have more parts available. Um, and the correct knobs. These are not the correct knobs for this radio. This radio, uh, while in fairly good shape, is going to need to be repainted. This whole thing is cast aluminum. This whole radio is cast aluminum with the exception of this top cover, which is some kind of very heavy, robust plastic. The loop antenna is built into the top but the rest of this radio, other than, other than the sheet metal here, which I think is brass, sure looks like brass. I don't think that's paint. Um, and if, no, I guess that's, is that plastic or glass? I'm not even sure. No, that's glass. So it's got a glass dial face on it. Uh, you can, probably can't see that. It's got a glass dial face on it. Uh, brass, and the rest of it's cast aluminum. This thing weighs 16 pounds without the battery, and it's got to be over well over 20 pounds when the battery is in it. Now this radio does not run on AC. This radio runs on a lead acid battery. Uh, how are we going to do this here? Tip it forward gently against my scope. This takes a 20, there is a cord. This cord is strictly for charging the radio, charging the battery in the radio. It's not for running the radio. What worries me about the one that's coming is in the ad, the guy says he plugged it in to test it. There they go again. Plugging them in and all it did is make a loud hum. Well, this radio is not supposed to be powered up unless there's a battery in it. The battery is the voltage regulator. It loads the charger down so that it stays within reasonable voltage levels for the tube filaments. So I'm probably going to have a few dead tubes. But the battery went in here. It had a built-in hydrometer to tell you what the uh, state of charge was. Directly plug onto these two terminals. It just the whole battery just slid in there. It was a, a flooded lead acid battery, and uh, you can see a picture of it here. I think this is the one that Shango had. And uh, of course, it's no longer available. It's a 25 amp hour battery. Now I did find these batteries. I've got an 8 amp hour battery coming. 
this same company makes a 25 amp hour battery but it's about an eighth of an inch too tall to fit in here and it's about a sixteenth of an inch too wide and it doesn't have these back terminals these terminals would have to be taken out and relocated if it did fit in there they claim this set will run for 20 hours on a charge and I find that you know probably advertising wank because the radio supposedly draws 1.6 amps when it's running. It's a vibrator power supply. We have a vibrator right here. Uh, and it's a 20, 25 amp hour battery. So you're not going to, I don't think we're going to get 25 amp hours out of it. It might have gone 18, 16, 18 hours. Certainly would have run a long time on a charge, which is pretty decent, really. Uh, if this is no good, we have the guts to change it over to solid state. I ordered this the same time I ordered the one for the car radio. This is the low voltage version that runs on 2 volts. Uh, did I mention this was a 2 volt lead acid battery? It's one stage or one cell. But the 8 amp hour battery I've got coming, it's a gel cell. It's not a flooded battery, but it will fit in this hole and it'll probably give me five or six hours of runtime on the radio so I'll be able to demonstrate it on battery power and safely plug it in because it'll be able to charge. I'll just have to keep an eye on the charge rate because it's not a flooded battery. I bought this set because of the uniqueness of the lead acid battery, vibrator power supply and a portable radio and it's all cast aluminum. So I just wanted to have one of these in my collection. However, I am very, I'm approaching this with the trepidation, shall we say, because the damn thing is full of loctal tubes, and these are the bane of a repairman's day. Loctal tubes are just miserable. They were probably fine the first five years the radio was, was manufactured, but radio shop I worked in for a couple of, for about a year and a half the guy would turn down sets with Loctals in them um, he didn't want anything to do with them too many callbacks because you'd fix a car radio with Loctals in them the guy drive down a bumpy road it would quit working again the sockets are crap absolute crap um, seemed like a good idea at the time let me uh, let me grab a couple of tubes here, and I'll okay, show you what I'm talking about. This is your standard octal socket. It's this in focus. There we go. Octal socket, and you can see how long the pins are, and they're plated, and the tube socket pins wrap right around these. And every time you slide them in and slide them out, it wipes them clean. It you know you very seldom have problems with these sockets. In comparison. Look at the length of the pins on the Loctal socket. They're not plated, they're bare metal. I don't know what kind of metal it is, but they always get tarnished. And I'm, you know, you take a stainless steel wire brush and, and scrub them up, but the, the socket itself barely engages on these things, and they are always going intermittent. They are just miserable sets to work on. And another reason I bought the other radio is if I have to strip tube socket pins out of it to fix this one, I will. There's always empty pin positions on, or not always, but there's usually a few extra pin positions that are empty. So I'll pull the ones I can out of this set and relocate them if needed. And if I don't have enough, I'll pull the sockets apart in the other set. Or when the other set gets here, if it's the better of the two, I'll pull this one apart. But you can see, look at the comparison, look at the difference in engagement. Uh, once again, we're out of focus. Boom, there we go. Look at the difference in the engagement length on these two tube sockets. Even the 7 and 9 pin miniatures are nearly twice as long as this. These things are horrible. Uh, the guy I worked for used to send his work to another shop because he had a, a buddy who claimed uh, we didn't know what we were doing, there was no trouble with these. So we used to send everybody to him, and he called up one day and told us not to send anyone over anymore. Quit sending his the, the work, you know, work his way, <laughs> because 
he was having trouble with them as much as he was telling us we were wrong so uh, what are we going to do here well I probably I know that the buffer capacitor is under this cover I should probably pull this out uh, probably pull the case off of here why don't I pull the case off of here and we'll take a quick look inside let me get and some I forgot to give you an update on the triad cabinet I have ordered some uh, I watched a bunch of videos people sent me links one of them was the Yorkshire workshop I think was the name of it and the guy was uh, using veneer with paperback just like I have and he was going around corners which were even tighter than the one I have on the uh, triad however he had a solid block of wood he was veneering to and he didn't have to worry about how hard he pressed uh, he was using an iron to go around the corners and uh, I, it was amazing to watch him go around those tight corners with the iron and he had a great big deep well socket like you'd use on automotive work and the back of those are fairly smooth and he was using those to, to push the wood down into the adhesive as he heated it I was amazed at how rough or how aggressive he could be on that thin veneer and not damage it but again, he was working on something that had an extremely solid backing and the whole block was securely mounted on like a rotisserie thing so he could work it and flip it and work it and flip it so he could get around it real quick before the PVA adhesive set up. He was using the iron to uh, cure the PVA as he went. I cannot apply that kind of pressure to that cabinet. I'll break it. I know I had a lot of weight hanging on it, but that was distributed over the whole front. That wasn't uh, pressing down in any one particular area. And uh, I had somebody say that I can't use the foam to uh, press down on the veneer. He said I was going to leave dimples in it. Well, I totally disagree because when I took that thing apart, that veneer was perfectly flat. It was as smooth as could be. That's a very tight closed cell foam very small pores in it and uh, it's it just gave it the ability to follow the contours and press the adhesive down but the adhesive I've, I've oh where was I going with this I've got adhesive on order uh, it will give me you know a long working time a long lead time I ordered that today and then I got an email from the guy it's out from the Midwest somewhere and he said they're in a stretch of 20 below weather and he can't in good conscience ship the stuff until the weather warms up because if it freezes it'll ruin the glue ruin the adhesive and he won't be able to honor any warranty or any returns on it so I told him okay go ahead wait for the weather to change and uh, when it gets here it gets here so that is in progress I haven't given up on it by a long shot we will be uh, continuing with the uh, repair of the triad cabinet now this should come off well, what's holding us I believe this just lifts off the front now let me turn it over oh there it goes okay we'll unplug the speaker Come on. And again, everything cast aluminum. This whole thing is aluminum. Uh, I wasn't sure if it was cast zinc, because cast zinc usually is what they use for intricate uh, castings like this, but at least the advertising wank, the original advertising uh, that came with this radio said it is cast aluminum it says military grade cast aluminum so <clears throat> i'll take their word for it i guess i did look up there is methods you can use to determine if it's uh, aluminum or not but you know i don't have the chemicals available well here we go here's the inside 
and uh, built like a battleship. These are the rectifiers for the battery charger. Uh, from what I remember on the schematic, this is a choke for the filaments, for the heaters, or filaments in these tubes. These are one or two volt tubes. And uh, we have in here a bias battery for the audio output tube. Let me grab the schematic here real quick. Okay, uh, the reason I grabbed this set, of course, was the fact that it runs on a 25 amp hour flooded battery. It's got a vibrator power supply and a portable radio. It's cast aluminum. But it also has right here, this is a bias cell for placing grid bias on the 3Q5 output tube. Now, I've got some question, you know, questions here on the schematic. This says using a 20,000 ohms per volt meter that that grid should have minus 0.6 volts on it. And it's going through a one mega ohm resistor. So I did some experiments the other day. To get minus 0.6 with a 20,000 ohms per volt meter through a one mega ohm resistor, I've got to have 12 volts in this battery. Well, I know that's not correct. Absolutely not correct. There's no way that's a 12 volt battery. Now, if you can see in there, there's a holder here, and it looks like it might have three cells in it. I haven't taken it apart. Of course, you're opening it up with me. I could see this in the pictures that were on the SAMs. I knew there was more than one bias cell in here. The bias cells are either one volt a piece, or some of them I think were 1.2 or 1.3 volts a piece. So there's between three and four volts here would, would be more correct. So I got a hold of the riders and I got a hold of the most wanted schematics on this. And sure enough, on this one, it says on the grid, it's either going to be zero volts with a 20,000 ohms per volt meter or minus 4.5 measured with a VTVM, and that makes sense. If it's a four, <coughs> four, <coughs> excuse me, if it's a four volt battery, a four volt grid voltage because there won't be any drop across this resistor to speak of when you're using a VTVM, there'll be a little bit but it's gonna be a whole lot closer to minus four and a half volts. And the other schematic says the same thing. If I can find that particular page. So I'm, I'm guessing now, I, we'll, we'll, we'll pull this thing apart and find out. But the other schematic says the th same thing on the voltage chart that, uh, oh yeah, here it is. This is the general, I believe this might even be the general electric schematic. It says with a 20,000 ohms per volt, zero volts, and that's just about what you'd measure with a 20,000 ohms per volt meter and a four volt battery through a one mega ohm. You'd see a little bit of, you know, a couple tenths of a volt probably. But it says down here, minus 4.5 is measured with a VTVM. So that battery is going to be closer to three and a half to four volts. I'm gonna guess it was designed, I'm gonna guess they use like 1.4 volt cells so we'll work that out. That won't be hard to determine. The, the RCA tube manual says this tube wants to see about minus four volts on the grid. So that all adds up. So SAMs would have burned me there if I had just had the, only the SAMs. But uh, we'll pull that apart. We'll find out how many cells are in it. It looks like it might hold three. Best guess at this point. Um, in fact, we could probably make something up out of button cells, or I've got some uh, lithium coin cell holders, and lithium cells will let the, uh, what is it, uh, CR20 something or other, 2032, is that what they are? Yep, CR2032s, those are 3 volt batteries. 
so I will be able to come up with something to put in here for a bias uh, supply. These batteries last the shelf life of the battery or longer. Um, there's literally no grid current being drawn. This one it looks like it's been replaced at one time. I can see where this solder joint has been reworked. So sometime in its life it may have had that bat. well it definitely had that battery changed. But they last for years once they're in there. When I was just a pup and we'd get sets that had these batteries in them that were dead, we would poke a little tiny hole in them and drop them in a glass of water for an hour. And it used they used to wake back up and you'd put them back in circuit and sometimes they'd last a year or two. You know, you seal the hole up with a drop of glue afterwards to keep the moisture in. Sometimes you can get another couple of years out of them if you poked a hole in them and soaked them in water for a while. And here we can see the bottom of the Loctal sockets and right away I'm seeing there's an empty terminal, there's an empty terminal, there's one. A lot of times they use the unused tabs as tie points. So what would normally be an empty terminal may look like it's in use, but often there's no tube pin there. They're just using it as a tie point. But with another set coming, I'll have terminals that I can pull out of tube sockets if I need them. Because I know something's going to be intermittent in this set. It's virtually a guarantee. And I, no, maybe that's not a repair. That one mega ohm resistor back there, I guess you can see that sticking away up in the air but those don't look like those solder joints have been disturbed and there's another one sticking up in the air so maybe that's just the way they did it yeah there's one over here as well looks like we've got one two three four five six seven eight capacitors to change these are special uh, very uh, low inductance capacitors that are used pro I'll bet that's in the filament bypass circuit look at the tabs on that thing and that's only half you know 0.5 microfarad hmm let me uh, Let me take a look at the uh, little bit of the vibrator circuit. I'm going to open that up and we'll take a look at that. I did order, did a preemptive strike, and I did order uh, some buffer capacitors for this so that I would have them when they got here or when the radio got here. I ha I've had them for a while. Uh, where is it? Right here. It's a 0003 at uh, 1600 volts I think it is but I ordered some I think the ones I got with 3 kV but we'll want to put a fresh buffer capacitor in there before we put any DC power on here uh, we'll also apply DC and make sure that uh, the filter capacitor where's the filter hiding oh it's over here I can see the bottom it's a can filter type the can is on the other side of the frame here and I'll go after the uh, audio tube coupling cap. I'll bet that's this one here. We'll change that cap. We'll check the filters and I'll change the buffer capacitor and we'll try putting some power on here. Let me get the uh, uh, vibrator supply. Okay, the vibrator supply should be under this cover. Or the transformer rather should be under this cover. I believe these flathead screws come out and I think it comes out of there. From what I've read in the documentation, these hold the transformers in place. So let's see what we're up against. Now ah, it's stuck. Oh, there it comes. I'm doing this with great care. We don't want to fracture any of this cast aluminum. I don't think there's anything else holding that. 
No, nope, there it goes. And it warns about being careful because the leads are short and they, indeed they are. Okay, there's our buffer cap, 1500 volts, 0.003 microfarad. I see another waxy paper down here. Oops, I don't want this to fall and break any transformer choke wires. I think, from what I've seen in the documentation, that's our power transformer, uh, our filament choke, and our B plus choke. Oh, you probably can't even see that. Yeah, I can't tip it. There we go. Filament choke, B plus choke, buffer capacitor. More excellent cinematography. Okay, I'm going to change these two caps and uh, slide this back down in its compartment. There, oh, there's two caps, two two more of those low inductance capacitors. Ah, uh, how can I show you those? We've got a capacitor here and a capacitor here, 0.5 microfarad. And you see the double leads on them and how they're tied together. However, I know the voltage rating on those is several hundreds of volts. And those are at 2 volts. They're running 2 volts. There you can see the connections on them. I think I'm going to leave those in situ. Um, I have no fears of a two or three hundred volt capacitor breaking down at two volts and I'm certainly not going to find any replacements for those uh, there's uh, bus bars right through the center of them just like the one that's on the back so anyway let me get this buffer cap changed and the cap that's down below is Okay, that's got to be this 0.05. Then we go down below to the filter caps. Yeah, these are the filter caps. 15 microfarad, 15 microfarad. So that's got to be this 0.05 microfarad down in here. Get those changed out, and we'll put some voltage on here and see if the thing runs. Okay, I've replaced the coupling capacitor. Uh, excuse me. I replaced this coupling capacitor and since I was right there in the neighborhood I replaced this bypass cap right here and it was right in the same area and disturbing and it was in the way of this thing anyway so we have this out this is our bias cell quote unquote and as we stated a couple minutes ago the reason for this is these tubes don't have a cathode proper the filament is the cathode and if they tried to use that for bias it's going to throw the uh, filament voltage off and this tube needs to be biased to be operating for class a operation and as you know looking at the tube curve we have cut off up here we have cut off down here and we want to be running in the center of our tube curve for our class A operation. This sets the grid bias for the class A operation. And according to this, well not according to this one, but according to the other two schematics, we should have minus four and a half volts on that grid. This is what was in there. And this appears just to be a spring over the top. The tape that's around here I think was later a later edition probably after somebody rebuilt this the first time I don't know exactly why the tape is on here 0 0.002 maybe they used a capacitor shell that's what it looks like this is a piece of a cap shell looks like they gutted a capacitor and used the cardboard tube to put the batteries in so let's pull this little spring off of here if we can I think 
there's just two insulators and two contacts and uh, we have some button cells inside here of some nature Let's see what they are if they'll come out maybe come out this end this is the end it's all folded down we are recording yeah we're recording and these look like fairly old button cells these are the old style get that thing opened up see if we can get these pushed out of here ah there we go Oh, there's four cells in here. One, two, three, four. Now, I'm going to guess these were probably the 1.2 volt cells at one time. I knew there had to be at least three cells. These are, these are smaller than the ones that I'm used to seeing, actually. Let's get our calculator. And if we wanted, we in frame. Yeah, we are in frame. So we wanted 4.5, and we divide that by 4, 1.125, and 1 1.2 volts was a common voltage for these button cells. So these were probably 1.2. This was probably closer to 5 volts when it was brand new and fresh. That would be my guess. Now I have, as a replacement, a bunch of these. I've got a couple of cards of these. Whenever I need a button cell for something, I end up buying a whole strip of these because they're fairly cheap and I'll have them hanging on the wall if I need them. These are 1.5 volts. So if I put three of these in here, I'll have my four and a half volts. So I think that's where I'm gonna start with the bias. We'll just rebuild this with these and see what it sounds like and we can always go up or down in voltage from there um, these button cells should last the shelf life of the cells once they're in there because you basically don't draw any grid current there's no current draw it's it's pico amperes at best and uh oh where's my scissors way up there there we go so three of these will give us four and a half volts which i think and my guesstimation is where we want to be on the bias. So let me get these stuffed in here if I can. And uh, we'll put this, this is a clever little spring clip. And the contacts are nice and shiny, nothing's corroded. We just spread this out, clip it back over here with our new button cells in there and we should have a brand new bias battery right back in the same package. See you in a couple minutes. Well, yeah, did it again. I uh, <laughs> went through a whole explanation with the camera off. Okay, we have our rebuilt bias cell. Turns out that these are virtually identical in diameter to the button cells that came out. And three of these being thicker, stacked up to the same height as four of those. These were uh, originally 1.2 volts, these are 1.5 volts, so we end up with the same voltage, uh, 4.5 volts. And we can see up here in the meter we got our 4.5 volts. So we've got a bias cell that I can throw in there. It's certainly going to be close enough to put the tube somewhere near the center of its Class A range. And without this, the tube probably would have been in runaway uh, no negative grid bias it would have been probably turned on as hard as it can turn on and we may or may not have heard anything out of it it may have blocked it just been you know saturated so I'll put that in I got an, I know we got to be reaching close to half an hour uh, we'll uh, quickly check the filter caps put some uh, B plus in here and fire up the tubes and see if we have any activity. Couldn't resist a little experiment. I took these upstairs. I threw them in a pan of boiling water. Actually, I put them in a pan. I brought the water to boil. 
figured I'd force any gas there out and then I'd drop them in a bucket of ice water see if they'd suck any moisture in and one of them came back to over 1.1 volts briefly but even loading it with the VTVM you could see the voltage falling off so they've had it but I'm gonna guess they were 1.2 volt cells because when one of them came back to 1.1 volts uh, after all that time but uh, I was just curious to see if anything had come out of them but uh, like I say even the VTVM loading dragged them down okay let's uh, let's get some B plus on this real quick so we can wrap okay this. I just ran a check on the time and we're gonna be up over half an hour here so uh, we'll do a couple of quick other brief checks and rather than try to rush through this I'd like to be very thorough with this set with you we'll uh, pick up again on the next video this has a synchronous vibrator unlike the car radio which has an asynchronous vibrator and a rectifier tube after the transformer this one has an extra set of contacts here we talked about this earlier when we were discussing vibrators this serves as our rectifier by only connecting on the positive peaks as it jumps in each direction and sending those off through our B plus so to check my uh, filter capacitors with my power supply I've pulled this out of circuit just to make sure we have no path to ground and I can inject my B plus here and we can check the health of our filter capacitors just so we know it's safe to power up and again those are gonna get changed people stop freaking out about changing all the caps those are gonna get changed not a video goes by that I get somebody who says I change them all right away well good for you um, I like to make sure that I'm working with a set that's a functional and uh, you know isn't gonna have any expensive problems that I'm gonna waste money and time throwing caps at so right now we're going to inject our B plus at okay. 90 volts once again we're connected here on our B plus line we'll be checking both our filter caps just to see if they're viable for powering the setup and uh, I can hear the keyboards warming up now that looked promising the light went right out our volt our current dropped nothing that's well they're not super strong but they are holding a charge if I go instantly back and forth you can see I got plenty of light but if I wait a second there's not much there I can see a little flash of the filament so those filter caps are on their way out they're not holding much of a charge but they're not leaking and they'll be safe for power up and of course we'll immediately swap those out I've got some uh, those are 15 microfarad I'll throw a pair of 20 microfarad in there yeah these are not great but they'll do for now they'll do for testing and uh, so I'm happy with that I know I'm safe to put B plus on here I'm not gonna hurt anything and what else do we want to look at before I close this video out let's make sure yes that's off I want to be reaching in here with B plus on it I'll shut off the power supply otherwise I'll walk off and forget that I want to take a look at these uh, copper oxide rectifiers these things are supposed to be pretty reliable and in fact I was going to do a piece on nerd corner nerds corner on those because I found a battery eliminator circuit that uh, uses those type of rectifiers in it for uh, supplying A battery, B battery voltages for those farm radios as people started to get AC available or house current available to them they started using battery eliminators so they didn't have to get rid of their radios and one of the uh, circuits I was looking at says if after an idle period of 
several months to a year if the rectifier does not appear if these rectifiers appear to be low on output voltage the instructions are to short circuit the output to these rectifiers and let them get good and hot it says it will not damage them and it will bring them back to their full operating uh, capacity <laughs> which I, I, I had to read that like four times I said they want you to dead short the output from the rectifiers but according to uh, according to the documentation for that battery eliminator the way to rejuvenate these is to dead short them and let them cook for a while and it says it won't do them any damage and they'll come back to full okay, I'm gonna break in here just because I know somebody's gonna tell me I'm full of what the bull left in the field to reactivate the rectifiers, it is only necessary to short, connect together, the A plus and A minus of the plug or terminals of the socket for a period of four minutes. The high temperature developed in the rectifier during this period has the tendency to restore the discs to their normal rectifying capacity. The unit will not be harmed by this process and this is a silver tone power shifter one of I found a couple of dozen models of this depending on what radio you had and what A and B batteries you had they had different versions of this some of these had selectable voltage for the A battery but there's our dry disc copper oxide rectifiers um, they call these dry disc rectifiers and I did some research and they're copper oxide slat with a lead washer against the copper oxide for the rectifier. So there you have it. If your copper oxide dry disc rectifiers aren't working properly, short circuit them for a little bit. I've got the power switch turned off which puts these battery charging, these are the two rectifiers here. They go through the uh, this transformer for is this the one? Yeah, this is the charging transformer for the batteries. But with the power switch in the off position, the center tap is not on ground, so I should be able to check these rectifiers uh, and see. Well, we've got almost zero ohms in that direction. That must be ground. Let's see on the tab here. One way. Oh, look at that. Oh, I hit ground again. Look at that. One. Those are fine. Oh, that one's fine anyway. After all these years, those copper oxide rectifiers are fine. I'm just going to leave those right there. Uh, they're the originals, and there's nothing wrong with them. But there's a little bit of a higher voltage drop across these than you would see on a... Uh, silicon rectifier of course but 3 ohms those are perfectly fine absolutely serviceable incredible after all these years okay I'm gonna close this up for now we've got our our bias battery in we've got two caps changed and we know our filters are viable I'm getting tired I don't want to be making mistakes and uh, I know this video's up over half an hour at this point. So we'll pick this up again in the next one. Until then, I'm the Radio Mechanic, and we'll be seeing you soon. Bye-bye now.